15th, uh, Wednesday, May 15th. Welcome to the Punta Gorda City Council meeting. Let the record reflect that all city council members and city officials are present. We'll begin the meeting with the invocation followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Our Heavenly Father, we ask thy continued help and acknowledging in our councils the decisions made today. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly, and even now, while we are placed among things that seem to be passing away, hold fast to those that shall endure. We ask that you give us wisdom to make the right and proper decisions and continue to hold us in the palm of your hands. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, before we begin the meeting, um, I want to uh, call the council members' attention to our agenda. I would uh, like to request that we move item 7B from our regular agenda. I would like to move it up to the beginning of the regular agenda. Uh, that is the uh, discussion of loud music in Central Business District. I, uh, we have business owners here, I think, that would probably appreciate you being able to get back to their businesses and do what they do for our city. And so um, in the beginning of the meeting should um, move on along fairly quickly. So if you're okay with that? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, excellent. So uh, we will begin the meeting with the proclamations. And the first proclamation is uh, Memorial Day. Council Member, or Vice Mayor Matthews. Thank you. It's my honor to present this proclamation for the city of Punta Gorda. Whereas our nation is honor bound to join together on Memorial Day to remember the fallen heroes of our armed forces. And whereas on this day, as throughout the year, we honor and pray for the men and women in uniform who answered the call of duty and made the ultimate sacrifice to maintain the security of our country and the liberties we hold so dear. And whereas we also show our respect for the family members of those serving in our armed forces and the sacrifices that have been made to defend our great nation and our way of life. And whereas our grateful nation honors the selfless service of our armed forces and we acknowledge a debt of honor owed to those who have given their lives to defend and preserve America and our freedom, our values and the ideals of democracy. And whereas it is important for us as a city, county, state, and country to honor the selfless sacrifice of all the men and women of the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard who died in service to our nation so that we might continue to enjoy the freedoms we so deeply cherish. Now, therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida does hereby proclaim Monday, May 27, 2019 as Memorial Day and invites the public to attend the Military Heritage Museum's Memorial Day ceremony to be held at the Lashley Park Gazebo on Monday, May 27, 2019 at 11 a.m. to recognize those who have made the ultimate sacrifice throughout the history of our great nation. Passed and duly adopted in regular session this 15th day of May 2019, signed Nancy Prafke, Mayor. And accepting is Gary Butler, who is the Executive Director of the Military Heritage Museum. <coughs> I know you're used to being on the stage. I know. That's right. Thank you all for uh, recognizing Veteran uh, Memorial Day on uh, May 27th. It is a very, very special day of remembrance for th all those who died in sacrifice on behalf of our country. Uh, we are honored and we invite everybody to the ceremony uh, at Lashley Park on on May 27th at 11 a.m. to pay tribute to all who have fallen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. It will be a wonderful day. The next proclamation is National Public Works Week and Council Member Wine. Thank you. It's my honor, uh, particularly since uh, my experience with this particular department is they go above and beyond the call of duty more often than not. So 
Thank you very much. Proclamation, City of Punta Gorda, Florida. Whereas public work services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets, highways, public buildings, solid waste collection, parks, and canal maintenance, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction is vitally dependent upon the efforts and the skill of public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work that they perform. And whereas the American Public Works Association and celebrating this year's theme, it starts here, which gives voice to the impact of the many facets of public works have on modern civilization. Now therefore, the City Council of the City of Punta Gorda, Florida, does hereby proclaim the city of May 19th to May 25th, 2019 as National Public Works Week <coughs> and calls upon all citizens to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works personnel make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Passed and duly adopted in this regular session, this 15th day of May 2019, Signed, uh, Mayor uh, Nancy Prafke and City Clerk Karen Smith, and accepting will be Hope. On behalf of all of the uh, Public Works employees, I'd like to thank Mayor Prafke and all of the council members. Um, I know I speak for all of our employees. They're very dedicated, they're very hardworking, and they enjoy what they do to keep our little city of Punta Gorda looking great and uh, clean and um, keeping everything operating in as good a performance as we can. So when you see them out there, please give them a high five, will you, for me. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a presentation. It's our, the wizard himself is here. Um, our representative, uh, Jerry Paul, he represents us at the state legislature and other issues. So um, we're glad to see you here today since the legislative session is now over for this year and um, let you fill us in on how things have gone. Thank you, Mayor and uh, council members. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'll try to keep my comments fairly brief and uh, open it up for some questions and then uh, let you get to <coughs> the um, more pressing issues on the agenda. As you know, the legislative session, the annual 60-day legislative session just recently wrapped up relatively on time. We went over one, one day beyond the 60, so we went 61 days this year, ended on the 4th of Saturday. Um, the state uh, passed its budget, which is its only constitutionally required obligation for the annual legislative session. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about budget and then about bills <coughs> and about our specific items and then open it up for questions. Um, first of all, generally the legislative session this year was a little bit unique in that it's the first time in eight years that we've simultaneously had a new governor, a new pres president of the Senate, and a new speaker. So it was a chance <coughs> for um, them and their bodies, comprised of many new members as well following the recent uh, elections. Uh, work together for the first time. Um, so there were a lot of unknowns, but it ultimately came together. Uh, as to the budget, um, the budget has not yet been presented to the governor. Once it is, he'll have a 15-day, uh, depending on when it's presented, a 15-day <coughs> period to exercise the discretion of potential line item vetoes. But the legislature itself passed the General Appropriations Act, $91.1 billion, about 2.3 greater than last year. Um, the, the general theme of the budget this year was Hurricane Michael relief and a tremendous amount of funding, um, uh, roughly $2 billion went to that, which made it a difficult year for other appropriations. 
um, particularly water projects. As you all know, we had one water project request in the Boca Grande drainage project. Um, our delegation worked hard on that. Our uh, particular kudos to Senator uh, Albritton who got that in on the House, or excuse me, on the Senate side, uh, but at the final moments of the negotiations between the two, uh, uh, at the highest levels between the two chambers, a lot of projects dropped away and that was one of them. I feel fairly confident though that we can get some funding for that during the next uh, legislative session. Um, other major priorities in the budget were of course uh, water quality, uh, particularly uh, water uh, projects over in uh, southeast Florida dealing with uh, and Lake Okeechobee, um, which affects us on this side as well, but dealing with red tide, uh, red tide research, and blue-green uh, algae. There was also an increase in school funding, um, and we could touch on several other uh, issues of particular interest to you. There was a $300 million tax package, um, which included the sale, typical sales tax holidays uh, for schools, and uh, there's also a sales tax holiday this year, assuming the governor uh, signs that bill, that would allow for a uh, sales tax exemption for a certain period of time uh, to purchase uh, pre-hurricane um, uh, equipment, uh, preparation equipment. Um, generally, as to bills, uh, about 3,500, almost 3,600 bills filed, a total of 197 ultimately passed, which is not uncommon. Uh, the system is generally designed uh, to fail. Uh, it's supposed to be very, very difficult to, uh, to pass uh, a law, to change the law. People express frustration in Tallahassee about that, but I tell them all the time that if it weren't that case, we'd have lost the republic a long time ago. So it's difficult to pass a law, only a small percentage of bills actually pass. Uh, most of the bills um, die. Uh, most of the bills that had preemption, local government preemption language in them died. Vacation rental uh, bill, uh, even the plastic straws preemption bill, which actually passed the legislature, was vetoed uh, by the governor. Um, there were some bills that passed that, are per that you should probably take particular note of. Uh, there is one preemption bill, the vegetable garden bill, which I don't think affects us directly here in the uh, city of Punta Gorda, but for those of you who have heard a little bit about it, in some municipalities, typically on the Lower East Coast, um, municipalities will pass ordinances banning the growing of vegetables in your yard. And the legislature, that was w that's one example um, that demonstrates what we've talked about before, how this wave of preemption bills doesn't make sense until you see it from the perspective of people complaining that government is getting too big on the local government, on the local level. That's one example. So the legislature passed a bill saying that local governments can't ban you from growing tomatoes in your yard. So that bill passed. Um, most of the other preemption bills uh, did not pass. Uh, another bill that's of particular note, there was a um, uh, a measure that uh, House Bill 5, which requires that um, local tax referenda, that is to say um, local elections that would have the effect of increasing your local sales tax surcharges have to be held on general election dates. In some um, municipalities, there'll be some local governments that will hold a election to raise taxes for their own revenue, they'll hold that election only on a very unique day when there's nothing else on the ballot, there's no other election, and in effect, the only people that end up voting are the employees of government. <coughs> so, so, th so that bill passed and said you have to hold those uh, uh, elections to increase taxes on normal election days. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. That's something that the supervisor of elections will largely uh, manage on our behalf. Um, there is one, um, another uh, couple things to keep in mind. One, uh, th there was a bill passed that requires uh, uh, broader funding for insurance to cover uh, a, a prescribed list of, I think, 23 different cancers that are common, commonly um, uh, incurred by firefighters. So you'll need to keep that in mind in your budgeting process. Um, 
Sanctuary Cities bill passed, basically, and although the governor, I don't believe, has signed that yet, it essentially says that local governments uh, have to comply with federal immigration laws. Somewhat controversial, um, but uh, in Tallahassee it was, but that bill passed. I don't think that has a lot of effect here. I don't, uh, I've never heard of our, any communities in Southwest <coughs> Florida establishing themselves as sanctuary cities. Um, one other uh, measure to keep an eye on, there was a bill passed this year that allows a cost recovery mechanism for utilities doing storm hardening on their, um, on their power lines, which can also include undergrounding of power lines. And I believe if the governor signs that, then those utilities will probably reach out to communities, some of which uh, we have that are interested in undergrounding of their power lines, and there'll now be a process whereby the utilities can go to the Public Service Commission and gain approval uh, to recover costs to uh, put that in place. Uh, one last thing I'd say to keep an eye on, at least, doesn't directly relate to the legislature, but constitutional amendments. As you know, we wrapped up the Constitutional Revision Commission CRC process at the end of the last legislative session, and there were several, or excuse me, at the end of the last uh, election cycle, and there were several amendments to the Constitution pursuant to that. There is also a petition method for placing ballot initiatives, uh, initiatives uh, proposed amendments <coughs> to the Constitution on the ballot, and one that is moving through that is of particular interest to a lot of municipalities is the one that would uh, deregulate all of the electric utility uh, infrastructure across the state. It tends to get framed as, quote, uh, utility choice. In reality, what it does is uh, uh, deconstruct the entire electricity uh, system that we currently have, which on the local level has a lot of impacts, one of which is the loss of all the revenue from your franchise fees, because the language says you can't have franchises. So it would completely deregulate that. Nobody really knows who would provide electricity, who would manage the transmission lines. The, 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 the language is fairly poorly written. It's currently before <coughs> the Florida Supreme Court for review, but if that were to uh, get past that review, y'all would want to pay pretty close attention to that one, as is the League of Cities. Um, with that, one final note. Um, it was wonderful to have Councilman uh, Jaha Cummings up in Tallahassee this session. Um, I'm sorry that the mayor couldn't quite make it, but I think she made the right call for uh, health reasons. But uh, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, walking would not be a, been a good foot, a good thing for me with a fractured foot. <laughs> Indeed, for those who have made that trip, they you know how many how many steps that is. Uh, so you were sorely missed, uh, but Councilman Cummings did a wonderful job, represented the the city well. I will tell you that um, the city's enduring image continues uh, to be strong in the capital. You're well recognized, well respected. You were reached out and communicated with on a whole host of policy and budget issues as they move through the process. You're recognized as an entity in Southwest Florida that needs to be consulted, that your opinion matters. So you uh, continue to march down that path and I applaud you for it. With that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, I have a question in regard to the um, the electric utility or the utility um, -reg. legislation. The do the what? Deregulation. Well, no, it's it's for the recovery for storm hardening. Yes. Um, since we have a, um, a community here that is interested in going uh, underground utility, and uh, the question was asked of me, is that then something where um, FPL could then recover the costs on a per community basis, or is that something that they're going to uh, do on across the board across the the, the all um, ratepayers? Because there are some things we pay for. Um, as rate payers that are just tacked on as surcharges no matter where you are. And so it was just, um, if there's anything that you know about that. Great question. So here's generally <coughs> how cost recovery clauses and utility rate making works. As a general rule, all of the expenses in a regulated utility market, which is what we have in Florida, uh, the <coughs> state is divided up into certif uh, certificated areas and each utility has that um, that region and all of the customers within that region. And the grand bargain uh, is that in return for having a monopoly, all of those customers um, within the envelope of a single compan uh, com company, in, ret in return for that, 
they, that utility is required to provide electricity to every single person who wants it. If you're totally deregulated, it's eat what you kill, um, just like mm -hmm. any retail store. <clears throat> they can charge whatever they want, and you either pay that amount or you don't have electricity. Uh, but we're a regulated uh, uh, state, so the utilities' rates are capped, regulated by a government entity, the Public Service Commission, um, but they do uh, get at least the guarantee of that fixed set of customers. All of the costs for all of the customers within that utilities service territory are distributed among all. Now, there's different tariffs, so residential customers pay an amount that's different from uh, commercial customers, but there's a capacity charge and then there's a uh, per kilowatt hour charge and all of those fixed costs get blended into your rates and those rates stay the same for a period of years unless or until the utility goes to the Public Service Commission and asks for a rate case. In the interim, however, and that interim could be uh, ten, five years, 10 years, 30 years, in the interim there are variable costs that go up and down. Uh, an example would be fuel costs. The cost of natural gas, which supplies the power plants, which turns the generators, which makes the electrons flow, that cost, that, that price for natural gas varies on the spot market daily. So they can't predict exactly how much they're going to spend on fuel for the, uh, over a month, over a quarter, over a year. And so there is what's called a cost recovery clause. They get to go into the Public Service Commission routinely and ask for the rates to be trued up to pay those exact amounts as they're known. What happened in this bill, to get to the, the question, is that they created a cost recovery clause for power lines, much like fuel cost recovery. <coughs> so the cost, um, if approved by the PSC for a particular project, gets spread across the entire rate base of that utility, not across the whole state and not just on a, a, a community basis, but across the rate payers of that entire utility. Now, um, what's yet to be determined is what process um, the PSC and the utilities will go through in order to determine the ranking or priority of those projects, whether it is hardening power lines uh, uh, overhead or whether it's actually burying them, undergrounding them. But I suspect that what's going to happen if the governor signs that bill is the Public Service Commission will uh, go through a process probably 60 to 90 days of creating a rule. Then the utilities um, pursuant to that rule will reach out to all of these communities and ask which areas want to have that done and then they'll be put on a list and they'll go through some list of criteria to determine the, the ranking, the priority the cost and the timing. So um, I know that's a long answer to your question, well, but utility rate making tends to be a little convoluted. No, I, yeah, I worked for a utility at one time, and so I'm, I'm quite familiar with that tariff process. And, sure. Um, <clears throat> so, but it's, you know, the, the question was more, will it be spread across the whole, as you, I think that's what you just said, as the opposed to- The utility rate base. Yes. Okay. Uh, questions? Howard? So, be specific to the people in this room. If you live in Burnt Store Isles, uh, we will be getting from FPNL the results of an engineering study that's going to tell us what the cost is going to be to underground the electric lines in Burnt Store Isles. The people who live in Burnt Store Isles will then have a public meeting, which we, a, a committee of Burnt Store Isles property owners. Uh, have a committee and they will get people together probably sometime hopefully in January to talk about whether they want to assess themselves for undergrounding utilities, undergrounding electric lines. Based on this, it's going to be an interesting discussion because what if the governor signs that bill, then potentially somewhere down the road, we don't know five years, 10 years, two years, 20 years, if Burnt Store Isles community gets on the list, then the cost of undergrounding those electric lines could be borne by all of the FPNL ratepayers, not just Burnt Store Isles community. Mm -hmm. So the question is, where would that fall on the list? 
and, and it's going to be an interesting discussion coming up. That's why it relates so close to home. And I think the, the answer to that will be very closely related to the criteria that the Public Service Commission establishes for uh, the threshold determination that the expense is, quote, prudent. The, u the utilities go out and they spend the money on certain costs, uh, like buying fuel. Mm -hmm. um, but they then have to go back to the Public Service Commission and get those five commissioners who are state uh, constitutional officials to agree that the, the expense that they made was, quote, prudent. If they go out and they don't negotiate for a fair price on natural gas prices on a given day, mm -hmm. the PSC could say that wasn't prudent, you overpaid, and they can prevent them from recovering that. <coughs> so there's a list of criteria that have to be developed as applied to this undergrounding. Once, you, once we see that criteria, that will help better determine how communities would rank. There may be some communities that are high on the list based on those criteria and some that are low, but as Howard says, uh, we don't quite know the answer to that. But yes. ultimately, it is possible that undergrounding costs could be distributed beyond the community and throughout the entire rate base of a utility. Mm -hmm. And since you happen to be in FPNL's territory, uh, that's the largest territory in the state, so it would be distributed across many. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Debbie? As a semi-newbie to politics, can't, I've had this question asked of me and I have no idea how to answer it. What drives Tallahassee's urge to preempt local government? What's, what's behind that? Are they, are they politicians that failed at the local level and they're trying to get even? Or, you know, why would Tallahassee care if Punta Gorda lets people put gardens in their front yard? Um, well, we've had this discussion. It's a great question, Council Member. Um, on, a, on a broad or macro level, it it's, um, uh, doesn't make near as much sense until you see individual examples that are largely anecdotal that give rise to that. So there are people, on, there are elected officials whose constituents are the same as your constituents. Um, who get called and emailed routinely saying, I can't believe the government has grown so big that it can now tell me, a private property owner, that I can't plant a tomato in my yard. And so if local government, not this local government, not the city of Punta Gorda, but another city somewhere else, if another city somewhere else gets so big, gets so powerful, that it tells a private property owner that you can't plant a tomato, then what's going to happen from that is eventually you get enough property owners who want tomatoes who will make phone calls <coughs> and send emails and uh, traipse up to Tallahassee with signs and say, please, please, please back this government off. And if over time that happens enough, then eventually a majority of legislators will say, yeah, government's getting too big on the local level as to that issue. Now, the problem with that is... Um, Sometimes they overreact. Um, sometimes um, there are other mechanisms to maybe rein in the growth of government or the overreach of government. Maybe you don't have to pass a law statewide on that issue. But the point is, is that there are a whole host of examples like that that are somewhat anecdotal that don't apply in our area because we have a responsible local government. There are areas that do not, though. And there are parts of this state. It's a huge state, over 20 million uh, people in a very diverse state, and uh, there are places where government gets so big and so dominant over people's lives that it prompts those people to become very politically active, and the legislature reacts to that. You could say in at times that they underreact and at times they overreact. Yes, sir. Um, in response to your response, um, <coughs> From our, from my perspective, in my in our community, uh, local people can get involved in who their public officials are. Mm -hmm. You only have to look into this room to find out that we don't, uh, that we hear a lot mm -hmm. from our our, our uh, citizenry on how we're supposed to to respond. <clears throat> so they have. The, what I'm saying is, citizenry has the opportunity if they are so motivated as a local community to uh, have that impression upon their local. That's why we have ballot boxes. Mm -hmm. So 
from my perspective, it's still it's a slippery slope. It is that that we're discussing. Well, a good example of that is also on vacation rental. You know, we get lots of questions from residents. Can't you do something about this house that, down the street that has you know different people in it every night or or whatever it is? Um, it's destroying the character of our community, our residential neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. And the answer is basically no. The state legislature has, has taken that, that privilege away from us, and it's, it's the state statute says all we can control is the noise, um, trash, you know, um, you know, those kinds of things. We can't, we have no say in, in that regard. And, That's and those kinds of things are, are um, while I can understand in some ways there might be a, a community that, as you've explained to me, um, that Punta Gorda is a, a very well-run community. Um, there aren't that, that necessarily the same in other areas, and therefore it, what happens is they're taking a um, across-the-board approach to solving the problem as opposed to addressing the issues specifically. Overreacting. And they're overreacting, and then they're, they're taking away that control at the local level. And, and that's unfortunate. And um, I also, it, it's, you know, when those things come up, what disappoints me is I don't see any of the legislative delegation coming to us and saying, what do you think about this? How would you like for us to vote? We do that constantly with our residents, constantly are, are listening to what people have to say. Um, and we meet with residents and, and talk to residents constantly. Um, and it's that's why we're, I think, in such close touch with people. Um, and so for the, you know, I just. It's tough. Uh, yeah. You know, there's always been this tension going back to the Constitutional Convention when this, when the first governmental structures of our entire country were created. There has always been a tension in a republic mm -hmm. uh, between the relative authority of different governmental structures, between the federal government, the s what's left to the state governments under the Tenth Amendment within each state government, uh, how much is, um, what's the scope of authority statewide, uh, wh you know, what are the enduring principles that define a state that are going to be the same regardless of how many counties, and then what issues are left to the counties, and then within the counties what issues are left to the municipalities, and right on down the line to special districts and school boards and so mm -hmm. on. There has always been that tension, uh, and there has always been and always will be um, a broad spectrum of beliefs on where that line should should be. Uh, I remember when I served in the legislature, there were local governments that were passing ordinances uh, essentially b banning firearms. So you would have a lot of people who, um, who believed strongly in the Second Amendment and felt as though it happened to be in the U.S. Constitution uh, that believed that these local governments shouldn't be spending money, their taxpayer money, and their uh, law enforcement resources and all going around and, you know, taking away, they perceived, taking away that right. And so the state passed certain laws saying, no, statewide, uh, you know, here's where you can regulate, but here's some commonality or some uniform laws that we're going to have across all 67 counties. Um, you would hear, if you go to all of the debates on the preemption bills, a common refrain that you hear from some legislators, particularly the ones sponsoring those bills, is that local governments, under our Constitution, under our um, Florida's Constitution, uh, municipalities, counties, and municipalities are a creature of the legislature. The legislature creates them, and um, ultimately they ha the state level is what decides that <laughs> relative power between what is delegated to the municipality and what is done on the state level. I'm with you it, it, as a general proposition, you, as, as Lincoln said, you know, the government closest to the people is the government that's most responsive. Of course, there are always exceptions to that. You know, we have some things on the, that you want to have uniform across the state. So it's Good. finding that balance. Jerry, do you see the trend with the new legislature um, preserving the sanctity of home rule, or do you, are you seeing a trend the other direction? Because, I mean, we had the last couple of years, we had a, a trend that was pushing toward get, eliminating home rule, and I, and I sort of feel like some of the preemptive things that were brought up this year that ended up being vetoed out of the 
um, the budget and uh, approval process. It seems like there may be a trend going the other way now. It's essentially the same. It's essentially the same debate. Um, to what extent does the state preempt certain <coughs> laws um, to the state level? so that you don't have a patchwork <coughs> of 67 counties and 300 municipalities where people moving throughout the state can't tell what the law is in this community and that community. And it's that healthy balance, wh whether you call it preemption or whether you call it home, home rule, um, that is at issue right now on some of these, you know, on some of these topics. A couple years ago, there was a bill passed that um, preempted the regulation of anchoring of vessels to the state level because you had some municipalities, mostly in the Lower East Coast, um, that were banning the anchoring of vessels in all the waters in front of the condos. People living in the condos didn't want to see a boat. Um, and so it created such a patchwork that people moving throughout the coast of Florida, the, the world's capital of boating, couldn't tell where they were and were not allowed to be. Mm -hmm. And so the state said, enough, uh, enough of this fighting back and forth. We're going to preempt that to the state level. So there are instances where it makes sense, but as the mayor said, there are times when maybe there's an overreaction to anecdotal situations in some narrow municipal municipalities. Mm -hmm. uh, as a trend, um, I think that there it, that this legislature is a generally believes in less government, um, generally believes in more property rights, and generally believes in reigning in government when they believe that it's overreaching. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well. Thank you so much Thank for you. all you do. Thank you. Thank you. It's always a yes, pleasure it was great. Report, and I'm sorry that I took up so much time because I know this is not what you came to hear. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Jerry is an amazing um, consultant for us and, and representing our community up in, in Tallahassee, and we really appreciate his efforts. He's, he's been amazing. Okay, we will move to the public hearing. Oh, no, we have introduction of board and committee member nominees. If anyone is here and or out there um, that has nominated themselves for a board or committee member and would like to um, introduce yourself to the uh, city council, please come to the podium. Uh, if you can get in. <laughs> Is there anybody out there? I'm not seeing okay, anything. I'm not seeing anything. No? Okay, then we'll move into the public hearing agenda. And we have one a public hearing. Actually, it's an uh, ordinance of the city of Punta Gorda. And um, if you'd like to introduce Yeah, I, actually, before I introduce it, if there are any public comments on the items that are on the agenda that aren't public hearings, mm. uh, and we do have that one, uh, this would be the opportunity for the public to express any, uh, any input uh, on this item. So if anyone would like to come to the podium and speak on this one single agenda item only, um, then please come to the podium. Uh, please state your name and you have three minutes. Um, Seeing, seeing none, this is the second reading of an ordinance that I'll read by title only. An ordinance of the City Council of Punta Gorda, Florida, rezoning approximately 0.88 plus or minus acres of property generally described as 200 West Henry Street, Punta Gorda, Charlotte County, Florida, and being more particularly described in Exhibit A attached here too from its current zoning classification of planned unit development, PUD, to neighborhood residential, 15 units per acre, providing for conflict and severability and providing an effective date. Okay, um, any discussion on this item? I move for approval. Second. Okay, there's been a motion uh, and a, a second to approve this item. Uh, all in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. So Z01-19 was approved. We will move now to the consent agenda. And before we discuss this, if anyone would like to comment on any consent agenda items only, then uh, please come to the podium. That includes approval of our minutes, uh, invoices for the legal department, um, accepting a historic bridge plaque, which is uh, quite interesting, uh, and two police department requests. So if anyone has any comments, you can come to the podium. You have three minutes. 
Okay, seeing no one. Um, any council members wish to um, to pull any items? Howard, you have a comment. Um, yeah, it's not to pull any item. On the invoice from Person and Cone, while well, finance uh, would make the proper <coughs> payment, let me just call your attention. There are two invoices, <coughs> and the second invoice includes the first in invoice that, uh, so that what we're approving is $478.40 on one invoice and $83.20 on the other invoice. So that is the amount. Uh, we would have caught it anyways, but I just want to clarify. And that. both of those together equal the second invoice that's on That's there. correct. Yes. Okay. That's it. Gary. I'd like to ask Howard just to make a little uh, synopsis about the plat for the general population because it is interesting about the historic plat, uh, plat, where it came from and what it's about. Mitchell, you want to do it? Certainly. Uh, for the record, Mitchell Austin, Urban Design. Uh, at the beginning of uh, 2019, a uh, resident of uh, Charlotte County, Ms. Helen Shirley, contacted the city manager's office and said that she had something uh, of, of historic significance uh, and she wanted <coughs> it donated to the city. Um, staff went over and, and looked at the object and lo and behold, it was a rather large bronze plaque. Um, and the bronze plaque is the, the dedication plaque of the second bridge over um, <clears throat> Charlotte Harbor, which is the Baron Collier Bridge, which is located uh, where the US 41 northbound bridge is now. This bridge was dedicated in 1931, and it was demolished in the 1970s, to late 1970s, to make way for the current bridge. Um, when that demolition was occurring, uh, Miss Shirley and her daughter were taking <coughs> walks uh, along the harbor front, and they noticed this thing flipped over on the ground uh, in the demolition area. They kept noticing it on their regular walks over the course of about a month, and they said, they're just going to leave that there. We're going to pick it up because it looks important. And they took it and they put it in their garage at the house where it had been kept until uh, just this past month when city staff picked it up. And uh, it is the bridge dedication plaque from 1931 uh, from the State uh, Road Department of Florida, uh, noting that the Baron G. Collier Bridge was constructed in 1931. So, um, pretty cool, huh? Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah, I know there are a number of historians here in the in the audience so that can appreciate this and the importance this has to our community. Our history is very significant. So. Thank you. Thanks, Mitchell. Thank you. Okay, so um, the, are there any items that you wish to pull? None. Okay. Move approval of the consent agenda. Second. There's been a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Would all those in favor please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. So we will move to uh, the regular agenda items. And uh, we did change the order of the items. And before we discuss this, Howard, uh, would you uh, like to make some comments? So the item we're going to discuss first on the agenda, and it will be open for public comments, that's why everybody's here, is uh, the discussion of loud music in the Central Business District. Um, let me tell you what the agenda item is, and I'll tell you what it isn't. Uh, the agenda item that is on here is a discussion. There is no ordinance change on the agenda item. Council will not make any decisions on changing an ordinance because that takes a process, and even if they want to pursue that, that's a whole process you have to undertake. Why is it on the agenda? It's on the agenda because uh, we received uh, some, uh, a request from a resident of the historic district that we discuss music that's going on in the central business district. Music in the central business district is a vital part of our city. This agenda item Nowhere in this agenda item does it say that the city organization is shutting down music in the city. 
It doesn't say it. Now, included in the agenda item are attachments from other cities. Because if the question is raised, what are other cities doing, we ought to have some idea of what some other cities are doing. So we've listed some <coughs> ideas, some ordinances that other cities have done to try and manage music in their central business district in relation to the residential neighborhood around. That's all that's attached. We're here to talk about that. So when we discuss the topic, we are not shutting down music in the city of Punta Gorda. It is not happening. What we are trying to do is have a discussion about whether or not what is happening today is as is, should it remain as is, is it appropriate, should we tweak some things like we've done in the past. That's what the discussion is. It's a discussion. Thank you, Howard. <clears throat> With that clarification in mind, I know that there have been a lot of social media um, uh, chatters going on that are, are totally misconstrued things. And I've had people call me and, and actually I said, have you read the agenda item? And the answers are usually no. And I said, well, if you read the agenda item, you would understand. We're really just gonna discuss something. We, we are not shutting anything down, like Howard said. Um, so it's, it's meant to just be a discussion. And with that, uh, let me clarify that when we have citizens' comments on any of our agenda items, we ask that the discussion be respectful, no applause, and no, I see a lot of familiar faces out there who have been to council before, so you know this. Some of you are familiar faces because I see you in the restaurants or whatever. Um, so for those of you who haven't been to a council meeting, it's no applause, no cheering, because there are other people in the, in the audience that may not feel the way you do. And it, it's intimidating to those people. And we don't want to be intimidating to anyone, bully anybody. We want people to feel that they have the freedom to come and uh, have their three minutes. So with that, um, we will open up citizens' comments on actually any uh, agenda item for our um, regular agenda, which would include the uh, budget items on the bulletproof vest, the veterans park improvements, uh, the budget status um, on the um, enterprise funds, local option sales tax committee, the historic district initiative, um, and uh, the noise, and the city's comprehensive um, annual financial plan. You come to the podium, you have three minutes. And So please make a line right behind the person so that we can keep this going as expeditiously as possible. And if someone has already stated exactly what you were going to state for, for the sake of time, you can help us move this along by saying, um, I support what he or she said. With that, Mr. Lineberry. Thank you. My name is Steve Lineberry. I don't own a bar. I'm not a musician. If you heard me sing, the gentleman would have more complaints uh, listed. <laughs> However, I do enjoy photographing and uh, attending the various uh, events and bars uh, for the music. I've been a Charlotte County resident for 20 years and a Punta Gorda resident for five. Like the majority or many of the people in Punta Gorda, I was surprised to learn that we are here based on one resident's uh, information that he would like to have discussed. And I got to thinking if one person has the ability to do all this, what about the others that we don't you know, hear from? So I started a social media uh, petition, change.org. And I wanted to find out what other people thought because obviously uh, if, you, if the music's too loud, you call the police, you call 911 and you get a paper trail going. But nobody calls the police and say, hey, we're really having a great time. <laughs> How do you get a paper trail going on that? You do it <laughs> you know, by showing up. So. Anyway, I represent 4,400 signees of the petition that we started on Facebook. And uh, I wanted to give you just a couple of comments real quickly from the signers of those. Ken Williams, a Punta Gorda resident and realtor, 
had this from a client. He said, if this, or the client said, if this passes, we might have to find another place to live. Obviously now we find out it's not going to in its present form. The arts and music culture is a big reason we visit so much and plan to move here. Joette Hesse said, part of the charm of downtown Punta Gorda is being able to stroll among the streets in the evenings and listen to the various musicians and bands. It will change the feel of downtown without the outside entertainment. Uh, Sandra Slattery said, I love our lifestyle here in Southwest Florida. We enjoy the music, the restaurants, the fun things to do. It's one of the reasons we stay here. Without the music, there are no other places to live. So I have a uh, thumb drive that has 4,400 supporters and their comments for you. I'm asking you to consider the wishes and needs of those 4,400 supporter petition signers. And please, don't let the music die in downtown Punta Gorda. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Mike Riley. Um, thank you for having us and having this time. Um, discussion lots of times leads to action. And that's a fact. Um, I, I have a band called the Boogeymen that I've had for almost 30 years in this town. Um, and in my part time, I work for Charlotte County Public Schools. Uh, <laughs> according to Superintendent Dionisio. But I recognize that I, I have a serious responsibility, and it's to keep music alive in Punta Gorda. And it's a pretty honorable position to be in. Through the 29 years of the band, we've done 148 charity events to benefit children's groups and nonprofits in this community and would be hard pressed to find a, a charity that we haven't done something for. Right. Um, a lot of those things take place in the evening. Um, I look at the, I came here 40 years ago and I didn't cross the bridge for 10 years. There was no reason to come to Punta Gorda. I've lived in Fort Charlotte, like say 40 years, 99.9% .9 of my social time is spent in downtown Punta Gorda. It's a beautiful place. I, I respect each and every one of you, and I think that you love our community as much, and you know that the music brings life to the town, and um, I just appreciate the opportunity to say what I think. So thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Bill Aiken. Some of you know me from the, the Vietnam Wall uh, days. I was the director of fundraising. And yeah, now that we've honored the ones that, that didn't make it back, we'd like to honor the ones that did. Currently, Vietnam veterans are dying at a faster rate than the surviving World War II veterans. So on March 28th of next year, we are going to hold a parade and a ceremony. I've been working with staff on it. And we're going to have a big music fest in Lashley Park following it. And this is going to be big. We're going to have national coverage on this. You may know who Lee Greenwood is. I have his contract right here to appear. So uh, this is going to be big. Now, the park's not finished up yet. So uh, I would encourage you to, uh, you know, find the funds to get the park fixed up because it's you're going to be in the spotlight and uh, it'll be a time for Punta Gorda to shine to the whole country. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm John Calipo. Thank you, uh, Council Members uh, Carrie and Matthews, for getting this on the agenda. I think it, it really needs to be discussed. Thank you, staff, for putting together some excellent data. Uh, in reference to what our other communities are doing throughout uh, Southwest Florida. It is not my intention to ban music from the downtown. Uh, NBC2 did a disservice to this community by saying that uh, the whole intent was to just cut all music off. That can't be any further th from the truth. My wife and I frequent the downtown areas and some of the music venues, and we appreciate those. Let me repeat that. It is not our intention or my intention to ban the music from the downtown. Purchasing our home downtown um, back in 2007 and, and moving into it 10 years ago, um, many of the bars and restaurants were not here. Hurricane Charlie's was not here. Shorty's was not here. The Tiki Bar was not here. Downtown Gators was not here. Carmela's was not here. Dean's and the Celtic Ray outdoor bandstands were not here, and nor was any problem. Our noise ordinance is antiquated, and it needs to be revised to protect the rights of the citizens in our city. No one's lives should be disturbed by any business. I have tried to be neighborly, and in, in the beginning would call um, those bars playing the music too loud. And sometimes they would turn it down, and sometimes they wouldn't. So 
I soon realized that the only way to address this would be to call law enforcement and have them start documenting the problems. As it is currently written, the police cannot enforce anything as they told me on so many numerous occasions. I'm a local contractor and I've received emails blindly sent to all contractors stating our allowable work hours emptying our dumpsters, maintaining silt fence, and it goes on and on and on. And if we don't comply, then there will be consequences. A lot of times they'll threaten to shut our jobs down. So why is it that some businesses are required to follow rules and others have no rules? Self-policing is not working and it is evident by the written police report that was made to one of the police officers. And I quote, made contact with deans Manager said, not obligated to turn down. I live four tenths of a mile and half a tenth or half a mile from some of these businesses. How loud do you need the music? I am asking city council to direct staff to rewrite the noise ordinance to conform with some of our neighboring communities and prepare for future business growth in the downtown area. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, board. My name is Lee Richardson. Good morning. 